Okay, welcome everybody to this talk at KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe 2021 virtual. Um, despite having been involved with the CNCF for four years, this is actually the first time I'm speaking here, so I'm very excited about it. Um, so the title of today's talk is Taking Bare Metal to the Clouds with Tinkerbell. Um, and let's jump into what that's gonna look like. So I'll explain a little bit about myself. Um, I think one of the questions that a lot of people are gonna have is why would people be interested in running their own hardware anyway? Uh, so I can share something around that. Um, assuming you do wanna do that, I wanna explain how Tinkerbell fits into the picture, which is sometimes a little complex. Um, I'm gonna look a little bit into why we decided to open source Tinkerbell from Equinix Metal in the first place. Uh, there's a lot of new exciting stuff in our 050 release that I'm going to go through. And then last but not least, I'll talk about how people can get involved if they want to or if they want more information. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Developer Relations at Equinix Metal. Some of you may remember Equinix Metal as Packet. And up in the top right, you can see this little logo that I really love, which is the Packet bot with a sword riding on top of the Equinix Metal Fortress. Um, now, I was involved in the CNCF from 2016 until December 2020. And I put the little wink there because uh, when speaking with Priyanka, she said I could call myself the CNCF Marketing Chairperson Emeritus for a little while. I'm not quite sure how long, how long that one's gonna last. Uh, I live in North London. And importantly for this talk, until I started at Equinix Metal, I hadn't touched any hardware really since about 2001 when I was working on gaming PC. and. Um, we're going to look at some of the things that I've learned in this talk. So why are people interested in running their own hardware again? Well, actually, it's not again. People always have been. But I think there is the perception in some quarters that those companies still running their own infrastructure are what the crossing the chasm model would describe as laggards. But this may not be as it seems. Um, public cloud adoption has accelerated the development of many technologies that can help companies to change the way that they deploy software more easily. Kubernetes, of course, is an excellent example. Um, but there are actually many reasons why people would be running on-prem hardware still. And we're gonna look at some of those now. As I see here, despite the apparent hegemony of public clouds, most companies run their workloads across a wide range of infrastructure. And there's a few really good reasons for that. Um, one is kind of obvious. Any company that's been around for a while uh, will tend to have infrastructure of various types. You know, they may have had large on-prem deployments back in the day and they've moved some of that to the cloud, but some of it has remained for various reasons. Um, acquisitions are a huge driver of hardware heterogeneity in that if you acquire a company, you're often faced with a choice, which is, well, you know, do we want this company to spend the next two years using our cloud or our way of deploying software? Or do we instead want us to focus on making money? And very often the answer is the latter. So what you end up with is through multiple acquisitions, companies end up with lots and lots of different types of infrastructure, including on-prem, but also multi-clouds. And I'd argue that one of the primary drivers for hybrid cloud is actually acquisition. If you're running on Amazon and you buy a company that's GCP shop, sit on your hybrid cloud um, or multi-cloud, I should say. Uh, and last but not least, many companies have requirements that aren't best suited to public clouds, um, whether that's around custom hardware, whether it's around compliance in their jurisdictions, whether it's uh, for performance reasons, for special workloads that they have. Uh, there are lots of good reasons to run your own hardware, but we'll see that it does come with some challenges. Also, um, edge computing is something that I've been watching for uh, it feels like forever now, since 2017, and often it was conflated with 5G. But I think what we're starting to see this year in particular is edge really becoming a thing finally. So we're seeing all sorts of companies wanting to put hardware closer to their users, whether that's in your uh, office, whether that's in your store, whether it's in your baseball stadium. Um, there are many reasons why having a data center of, type, of, of sorts nearer to your user would be a good idea. And of course, what that means is that um, you're going to be running that in a way that you perhaps wouldn't be able to do in a public cloud. You're going to be running your own hardware. And I think what this creates is sort of interesting. Um, you, you know, there's this sort of idea that anyone who didn't go to the cloud is potentially a laggard, but really what we're seeing is that now there's really an opportunity for those who um, perhaps 
were using on-prem because they uh, because they decided not to go to the public cloud or because they had a special reason to, or often because they went to the public cloud and then found that actually at the scale they were running at, it made more sense to come back off the public cloud and to run on-prem. And what we're seeing is that with some of the developments, Tinkerbell is only just one of them, there is real opportunity here for those, uh, those, those laggards, uh, if you will, which I obviously don't agree with, to become the early adopters of a new wave of cloud native innovation, um, taking advantage of a lot of the tooling in the cloud native ecosystem to be able to run their own hardware at scale without having to use a public cloud. And of course, I'm not the only person who's noticed this. Um, you'll notice that all the public clouds and a lot of the major software vendors are creating their own hybrid multi-cloud edge tooling. So top left here, we have SAP's Gardener, uh, Google Anthos, VMware Tanzu, Azure Arc, Red Hat OpenShift, Kubematic, a smaller player, but an important player. There are many of those. And then of course, the big news from the end of 2020 was Amazon's EKS Anywhere, which as they say, allows you to run EKS in your own data center. Now there's a reason why they're all doing this. And it's because of some of the reasons that I alluded to earlier. Um, running your own infrastructure is sexy again. I'm gonna look at some of the challenges of that. I think in particular, um, if you look, for example, at the Google Anthos web page, a company, uh, a project that we've done a lot of work with, um, you'll see that when you look under the requirements, they list a bunch of servers. Like go buy these servers from Dell or Supermicro or whoever you want, and then you can run Anthos. But as we'll see in a moment, uh, it's a little more complex than just getting those servers shipped to wherever you want them to be if you're going to go ahead and be successful with this. Okay, so you want to run your own cloud now. Great. How does Tinkerbell fit in? Well, first, let's start um, a little bit further out. Um, I wish I could tell you that Tinkerbell is a one-stop shop. Uh, I found that I was Googling one-stop shop and I found this. Apparently, this is, a, this is a chain of stores in the north of London where I live. I've never been in one. It's a convenience store, but there we go, one-stop shop. I wish I could tell you that Tinkerbell is a one-stop shop for running your own infrastructure, but it isn't. It's a complex stack, as we're going to see, and Tinkerbell is just one part of that. And later in the talk, I'm going to talk about why we specifically focused on that part of the stack. But for now, let's take a 50,000 foot view of what it looks like to actually run your own cloud. So I wanna first emphasize that this is a massively oversimplified view. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on here and you can probably imagine that at every layer of this sort of proposed stack, there are many different vendors, all sorts of options and some of the layers I've totally missed out just for brevity. But let's start at the bottom. So one of the things that's often overlooked, you know, if you're using VMs through uh, Amazon, for example, is real estate. Like those VMs have to live somewhere. And if you're gonna be running your own infrastructure, you're going to need real estate to put them in. Now that would be fine if it could be your bedroom, but if you're running at any kind of scale, it's gonna need a bunch of other things that maybe don't fit in your bedroom. So for example, air conditioning becomes very important. And air conditioning is of course an entire, data center air conditioning is an entire industry that is very mature, has its own vendors, has its own best practices. And that's something you're gonna to have to get good at. On top of that, you need power, and that can't necessarily just be the power that's coming out of the plug in your bedroom, but you're probably gonna need backup generators and all sorts of things. Again, depending on the scale of your deployment, there can be smaller deployments that would work perfectly fine with, uh, with normal house electricity. But you know, when you get to a couple of racks, suddenly that's becoming difficult, especially if you need to make sure you're hitting those nines and being able to deal with things like brownouts. Um, networking is kind of obvious, both internal and external. So your machines are all going to need to speak to each other, which means they're going to need networking. You need switches and routers and everything else. But also externally, uh, you're going to need to get whatever that data center deployment is connected to some sort of uh, internet connection or some sort of connection so that you can get onto the internet so that you can communicate with the rest of the world. Again, at very small scale, that might work in your bedroom, but your ISP might be a little upset if you start running data center scale bandwidth out of there, so you might look for a different provider. Um, perhaps most obviously, you need servers and server racks. Now, uh, all of you will have seen servers and all of you will have seen server racks either on television or in person. Um, we don't have time to go into it today, but server racks, even though they seem like you know pieces of metal that you slide things into, are themselves 
areas of great disruption. And one of the uh, projects that we're very excited about at the moment is Open19. Um, Equinix and a few other companies have open sourced our chassis designs for uh, server racks. And we've made the Open19 Foundation in the Linux Foundation so that others can benefit from that. But we'll come back to it. Once you have a whole bunch of servers and switches and racks and everything else in there, you're going to need data center infra infrastructure management or DCIM software. Now, DCIM software can be seen as a sort of catalog of all the things in the data center, a kind of metadata service. But they also take care of often monitoring things like heat, utilization, and other stuff. Coming back to the uh, networking idea from earlier, you're going to need IP addresses. And uh, the last time I ran a data center, well, I, I didn't even run it. I was part of running it, but it was a long time ago. And we used to track IP allocations in a spreadsheet. Now, again, it's not ideal, but it works at small scale. When you get to larger scale, you're going to need IPAM software, IP address management software. That means that you're not giving out IPs to the wrong people and that you can sort of defrag the IP space and make sure you're making the best use of that. If this is a commercial offering, a commercial cloud, or a cloud that you want to be able to measure the usage of, even if it's an internal project, perhaps with internal billing, or just so that you can give parts of your cloud to different projects within your organization, you're going to need metering and billing. What this basically means is I need to know how much you've used of what. Um, next up is server provisioning. So when you have all of the below in place, you now need to take those shiny new boxes you've got in your racks and you need to make them do something. And that basically means taking essentially an inanimate server and getting it into a state that somebody can use. Now, we're gonna talk more about this later. Um, then we get above the water to the bits that people are typically familiar with. Uh, you need a user-facing API that has access controls and a whole bunch of other things in there so that people can actually request resources from this, this cloud or this data center you've created. Um, they're going to want operating systems on top of that. And those operating systems need to both be uh, repackaged to make sure that they work with the hardware that you have with all the correct drivers, but you're also probably going to need to enter into relationships with operating system providers to make sure you can get the latest images from them and so that you can uh, conform to many of their uh, usage contracts. And then last but not least, and of course, there's a lot more on top of this, but there's a deployment layer. Most people want to put something on top of those servers, on top of the OS. So it could be you have a virtualization layer, you could have a, a containerization layer exposed through Kubernetes, whatever it is, you may also be responsible for this part. Okay, so where did we decide to focus with Tinkerbell? Well, Tinkerbell is specifically around what we call server provisioning. Internally, we often call it bare metal provisioning, but it's this layer of the stack that takes your servers, which are networked, they're in racks, they've got power, they've got networking, they have real estate, they've got everything else. And now you need to take them from being what is essentially this inanimate object and provision them in such a way that they do something useful. You may want to, for example, um, update the firmware now, all of your servers will have all sorts of firmware in them. And uh, at any kind of scale, you don't want to be walking around your data center with a USB stick and a keyboard trying to update all of those. So having a central way where you can address those servers and ask them to perform update tasks is very important. Perhaps more interestingly for the end user is that those servers only become interesting really once you put an operating system onto them. Very few people are going to be interacting with these before they have an OS. But there's a few things you have to do before the OS. So for example, you may need to format some disks. You may need to set up some um, uh, RAID configurations and a whole bunch of other things, then install an operating system and then present it to the user. And we're going to talk about why we focused on that bit a little bit later. But now we're going to look at exactly what Tinkerbell does. So focused on the idea of um, provisioning servers, it's a little it's a little bit too much for, for this talk, but what I would point you to are two specific resources. First on the right, Alex Alice wrote an incredible uh, blog post for the new stack in 2020, where he talks through the actual net booting example of taking a server, which doesn't know what it is, who it is, or what it's supposed to do and get it into a state where we can deploy an operating system. So I'd recommend reading that. You can also go and look at our Tinkerbell 101 video, which takes you through specifically how our stack works. But what I'm going to do now is give you a high level overview of how the various parts work. So if you imagine that you have a bunch of servers with Tinkerbell deployed somewhere in that network and they want to do something, 
the first thing they're going to do is boot. And when they boot, they're going to send out a DHCP request. And this is where Tinkerbell gets involved. Tinkerbell is going to intercept that DHCP request through a service called Boots, and it's going to start something. It's going to use iPixie to start something called net booting. Now, essentially, the way this works in the back end is that you have your fleet of servers, and they're probably all in some sort of DCIM, data center, data center infrastructure management tool. And in Tink, what we have is a list of hardware definitions. So the hardware definitions say, okay, if, if, if a server with, for example, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be limited to, if a server with this MAC address sends us a DHCP request, I want to run this provisioning workflow. And that's the way we map the two. So in the happy path, we get a DHCP request from a server and we say, we have a workflow that matches that MAC address. We know what to do with it. The workflows are relatively simple and they all live in Tink, the element you can see at the top. Tink will then say, great, I have a workflow for you, but I need a way to be able to execute commands on that machine to get into the state it needs to be in, which is where OZ comes into play. OZ is our OS install environment and it's an in-memory operating system that we run on the server so that we can run all these other actions until it's up to date. Now, Hegel, is related to this, which is that it provides the metadata we need to understand what the server is, um, what's it, what, what it's intended to do, maybe what some of the adjacent factors are. But essentially what we're going to do is just run OZ on the server controlled by Tink to run actions like I mentioned earlier, which would be, you know, format the disks, uh, I don't know, all sorts of stuff, but essentially probably install an operating system so that you can use it. Um, once that's done, we're going to use the service PBNJ, Power Boot and Control Service, to restart the machine, and it will then come up into the fleet in the configuration that the user wants it to be in. And at that point, it will be ready for use. Now, again, that's a massive oversimplification of how this works, but you can check out Alex Ellis's blog post and also go to Tinkerbell 101 to see this in a little bit more detail. But essentially what we've done is we've gone from a machine that is waiting for a purpose to a machine that is installed in the way that the user wanted it to be, and we can then deliver it to them. So everybody by now will be familiar with the idea that software is eating the world by Mark Andreessen. But when I hear this, I hear something else. What I think is that essentially what's happening is that the amount of hardware that can be eaten by software is expanding, and then software is extending to fill those gaps. Now, the reason why we want things in software is obvious. It means we can experiment more quickly. It means that we can share our work. It means that we can um, build on the work of others. But when we were looking at the stack for Tinkerbell, we specifically thought, well, a lot of those other areas have reasonable solutions already or are too far away from the user to be interesting. So how do we open up that next bit of surface area that people will be interested in hacking on? Now, a related question to this is, well, then why would we submit it to the CNCF? Well, so we open sourced it in, I believe, May of 2020, and we didn't get into the CNCF sandbox until something like October or September, September, October, maybe November, I can't remember, end of 2020. The reason why we wanted to do this is it's pretty clear. Um, if you're going to be a piece of software that, this is, that is this critical to your stack, you need to know that the project you're relying on has open governance and you can get a seat at the table to influence the roadmap. You know, um, I'm sure there are libraries out there that people use every single day that are open source and they don't really think about the governance model that much. But if it's the software that's going to turn your servers into something your users can use, then you're going to care about that a lot. And I can talk later about the incredible uptick and adoption that we've seen in the CNCF. But uh, broadly, that's why we want to make that, that decision. All right, so we've gone from, why would anyone run their hardware in the first place? We've seen how people running their own hardware are actually at the beginning of a new curve of adoption here. They are the early adopters of a new wave, whether it's hybrid cloud, edge, on-prem deployments that they need for specialized workloads or other things. We've looked at what Tinkerbell does and where it sits in that stack. We've looked at why we open sourced it, but now I want to talk through some of the exciting new features that have been announced in April around what Tinkerbell can do for you. So 
you've heard me say operating systems a lot of the time, and that is just one of those key workloads that we enable is getting a server to the point where you can put an operating system onto it. And we've done a lot of work in Q1 2021 to make the process for adding new operating systems a lot easier. And what's that, what that's meant is that we can now install pretty much anything you want. Now, out of the box, you'll see Red Hat, Windows Server, Debian, Flatcast, CentOS, Ubuntu, Nixos. I believe Alma Linux is in the works and there are a few others as well. But the reason why that's happened is because of the Crocodile project. And you'll see down there the GitHub uh, link for the Crocodile project. Now, Crocodile is a tool that makes it a lot easier to package and deploy operating systems using Tinkerbell to the point where once we get the first few working, it's often less than a day's work to get the next ones working. This is a significant improvement where previously it could have taken days, weeks, sometimes months to get these things working. And now this is all open to the community so they can add their own as well. Another area where we've been focusing is the cluster API. Now, as many of you here will know, cluster API has become the de facto way to interact with Kubernetes clusters. And we wanted to make sure that those people who wanted to use Tinkerbell to get them from bare metal all the way up to Kubernetes could do it in a way that they were accustomed to. Um, the work with the cluster API in Q1 of 2020 is what we've been called, what we're calling experimental, which is at the moment it is in a proof of concept stage and it allows you to do some actions, but not all. Um, early community feedback has been very positive. And because of that, we're going to continue investing in this throughout 2021 so that we can get to parity with other providers so that you could essentially bring your own servers and use Tinkerbell plus the cluster API to be able to create a Kubernetes cluster from a bunch of machines that before that didn't yet know what their purpose was going to be. Now, as we're working on Tinkerbell with the community, one of the fantastic things we've seen is that the community has allowed us to see where the pain points are, both getting, getting started, but also with implementing extensions to Tinkerbell, whether it's workflows or working with the core product itself. Uh, Hook is a drop-in replacement for OZ. So you remember earlier I spoke about OZ, which is our in-memory operating system where we can run all the actions that allow us to run the workflows to get the server from the state it's in to the server it needs to, to sorry to the state it needs to be in. And the results have been incredible. We've made it so that we can now um, deploy in something like 10% of the time previously. So we're often talking about minutes to deploy new operating systems onto bare metal machines now, including a reboot. Um, including some of the bigger operating systems. Now you remember earlier when I spoke about workflows, workflows in Tinkerbell are essentially the actions that Tink runs in OZ to get your server from being a server to something that people can actually use. And those workflows consist of uh, atomic elements called actions. And each action is essentially a Docker container that runs something. Now, one of the things that we were very excited about early on was making it so that these actions could be contributed to in the public. And that's why we now have what we call Action Hub. It's hosted on the CNCF Artifact Hub. And what this allows people to do is to compose workflows of known public actions. They can also extend them, they can add their own. And this is already opening up a huge amount of energy around building out new actions, improving existing actions. And it's all very similar to the Docker Hub. You know, you, 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 can, you can use one of our actions, you can extend it. I think one of the other areas that's interesting is that firmware updates for servers are often a bit of a headache. And we're going to be looking at how we can work with uh, server manufacturers and OEMs to have them provide their own actions for providing uh, firmware updates for their servers through the Action Hub so that anybody can take advantage of those no matter what servers they're running. Okay, and then last but by no means least, we got into the sandbox in um, end of 2020. And one of the things that we're now excited about is moving to incubation within the CNCF. So we're gonna be actively exploring that in Q2 of 2021. The reason why we're doing that is because as we're starting to see more and more partners from the industry coming in and adopting Tinkerbell, having that 
open and clear governance through the CNCF is becoming more and more important. And we want to make sure that we keep stepping through that process so that everybody involved can see that this is a group effort, uh, which it increasingly is. And I would encourage you to go and look at our dev stats. Um, it's been amazing to see the difference between, let's say, December 2020 and now in the sheer number of contributions we're getting from companies outside of Equinix Metal. And it looks like if we keep tracking the way we're tracking right now, we're going to hit parity with internal, external within about two months. Um, and we also have some big announcements around certain logos, et cetera, that are coming on board. So look forward to that. Okay, so I realized that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, let me give you some information on how to learn more or to get involved. So first and foremost, we have a community Slack at Equinix Metal, slack.equinixmetal.com in the Tinkerbell channel, you can sign up. That's where we have a lot of our live conversations around things. Uh, we also have community calls. I believe they're bi-weekly and we have them in US and EU friendly time zones. Uh, if you go to the Google group that's listed there, uh, and all of this will be sent out in the PDF slides afterwards so you can get the links without having to screenshot this and type it in. Uh, you can join those. Um, GitHub, obviously, Tinkerbell is the org. You can find all the microservices within there and all the documentation. Uh, Twitter um, is a good place for news. YouTube channel, you will find not only the recordings of our previous community calls, but also some of the 101s and other educational content that we've got coming up soon. And then uh, if you want to email us, you can email at hello at tinkerbell.org. That goes to me, I think Dan, and a couple of other people, but you get a response pretty quickly. And on that last one, tinkerbell.org is the main website. We've done a phenomenal amount of work on documentation in the last few months, and it's really in a state now where people can very easily get from um, zero to hero, so to say. Now, a lot of people don't have a data center at home. So one of the other things we did is created a local vagrant installation that you can run. You're going to need a bit of RAM, I think at least 16 gig, but then you can run your own Tinkerbell setup where you can have a, you know, the Tinkerbell stack plus some sort of example servers. And you can see how the workflows work, how you can insert different options there, configure some of the way that things are deployed and see how you can also take servers, in this case virtual, to being useful by installing operating systems onto them. Uh, last but not least, um, we also have the sandbox. So there are a lot of different, different microservices within, uh, within Tinkerbell, and it was a little unwieldy for people at first to be able to figure out exactly how to get it all working together. So we introduced the sandbox. The sandbox is a known good state of all the microservices that you can run together to make sure that you know, they're tested. Um, and I believe this is also where the Vagrant is pinned to. So you can try that out locally easily without having to crack out some servers in your bedroom. And that's it. Um, like I said, you've got all the contact details. If you want to talk to me personally, it's mark.coleman at eu.iconics.com. I'm at Mr. Mr. Coleman on uh, Twitter. And if you go into the aforementioned Equinix Metal community Slack, uh, you can find me on the mark.metal. Thank you.